underground, the difference was even more pronounced. The GM variety was large and healthy. Unmodified sweet potatoes, grown with traditional organic methods, could not compete. May I say that organic farming has not worked in Africa, and it, has, it is not going to work. It's not the answer. Ironically, says Wambugu, the answer for the least developed people in the world may be the most advanced technology. In contrast to complicated and costly chemicals, GM technology is built into the seed. All a farmer has to do is plant it. What farmers need is technology that is packaged in the seed, the seed that actually is resistant to the pests and diseases, and planted the way they have always planted. That to me is sustainable. The GM technology is appealing, and to me I say it's user-friendly. It does not demand the farmer to go and be educated how to use it. But can a poor country like Kenya oversee this powerful new technology without the equivalents of the USDA, EPA, and FDA? We have trained some of their researchers. We've also supported training of their, a number of their regulators to develop a Kenyan national regulatory system, which they have done. And we have trained their extension workers so that when it comes time to field test these um, plants in a number of different locations, which is currently ongoing, that they would know how to do that. Catherine Ives runs a program at Michigan State University to help developing nations produce more food. People understand that if they can produce more food, they can feed their families and keep their children healthier. You know, they understand that if they can make their land more productive, maybe they can send their children to school as opposed to have them out in the field all day. One of the biggest obstacles poor farmers face, especially in the tropics, is poor soil loaded with excess minerals like aluminum or salt. Near Irapuato, Mexico, for example, toxic aluminum greatly reduces productivity of crops like corn. Scientist Luis Herrera wondered whether GM technology might offer a solution. This maize is not growing very well because it has problems of soil acidity which lead to aluminum toxicity and low uh, nutrient availability. So what happens is that the root system of the plant doesn't grow and it cannot make, uh, it cannot supply the plant with enough nutrients to grow. And what the farmer finds is that the productivity of the plant is, is not good. Usually you should have this big and you have very little production. In his laboratory, Herrera genetically modified the maize so it would produce a natural chemical called citrate, which binds to the toxic aluminum, keeping it in the soil and away from the plant. The results were dramatic. So you can see here that the root formation of a normal plant in an acidic soil is not very good. And in plants that we produce uh, citrate, the root growth is much better. And this is a way we have to demonstrate that the system is working. When word of Herrera's research got out, Greenpeace arrived in Mexico protesting that his GM maize was unsafe. Under pressure, the Mexican government halted his field trials. We are not sure whether, because of the pressure of these groups, the government will never allow us to field test our technology, or if they will not allow us to to provide it to the farmers for commercial use. These people speak selectively only the negative thing, and they totally ignore the, the positive benefits, not only to humans, but also to the environment. The potential benefit is, is so important that this technology cannot be stopped. It must not be stopped. Herrera says there's much more at stake than his own research. We need more food. There is people daily dying because of lack of food. We have more food today on this planet per person than ever before in human history. 
But environmental groups reject the whole premise that GMOs are needed to feed the world. I think it's a ploy. It's playing on the guilt of relatively well-off people, that somehow if they don't approve of this technology by agreeing to buy the products, that somehow the result will be people dying of starvation in the developing world. You, you don't believe this technology can help people in the developing world? The biggest problem behind hungry people is lack of money. It's not technology. We live in a world today uh, where 800 million people a year are going hungry uh, in a world that produces uh, enough food for almost 9 billion people, uh, yet we only have 6 billion people on the planet. Why isn't that food uh, uh, being uh, distributed more equitably? Uh, it's because people uh, who can't afford to buy food uh, simply aren't being given it. It just isn't being given to them. They don't have a clue what they're talking about because most of those people who talk like that get all their food from the supermarket and they just think how it can appear in another place in another supermarket. The transport costs in this country are huge. Even if that food was donated for free, it would have to cost something when it arrives here. And there's the pride. If you cannot feed your family, if you cannot feed yourself, you, you have a mentality that makes you feel you are useless. People have pride in feeding their family. People have pride in being able to purchase. Everybody, how would anybody like to be a beggar? I would like to be there waiting that until some food comes, you're going to stay hungry. Whether or not people in developed countries like biotechnology, they should not deny those potential benefits to the developing countries. We've got 800 million people who are chronically undernourished. We've got uh, 1.5 billion more people who will be added to the world population by the year uh, 2020. Now, that's an enormous number of people to be fed. And we believe that biotechnology, along with agricultural ecology, is going to be able to feed that population. Are the dreams of raising Africa out of poverty on a collision course with the concerns of people living in rich nations half a world away? To build this house, where we are today, there was a designer, there was an architecture, there were people. It took some time to build this house. It needs expertise. To build GM technology has taken years, has taken resources, has taken time. Now, if you want to destroy and bring down this house, you don't need expertise. All you need is some, some people from the streets, hooligans, give them hammers. They'll beat this house down within a day. And I believe that's what is happening. Greenpeace and many of those activists are just beating down a house that took years to build, years of research. One of the universities that supports Florence Wambugu's work in Africa is Michigan State University. They were largely unaffected by the GMO controversy until New Year's Eve, 1999. Well, I was walking into downtown East Lansing to go out for New Year's Eve, and we saw the fire trucks and the engines going towards the area where we worked on campus and saw smoke, and we said, this is a real fire. And I looked up and I counted the floors and I said, that's my office. Our offices were totally destroyed. I mean, they were pretty much reduced to ash. We assumed that there was an electrical fire, but it became clear to the investigators that it was an arson. The initial investigation, the issue was, did we have any ex-boyfriends or girlfriends that would be mad at us? After three weeks, police still had no idea who was behind it. Then a communique arrived from an underground group, the Earth Liberation Front. There's an Earth Liberation Front action at Michigan State University on uh, December 31st this last year, and it was a fire that burned down part of a building.